We're next going to look at three reactions that accomplish on a overall level a very similar transformation, which we call a hydration. In a hydration reaction, the alkene absorbs a hydrogen on one carbon and a hydroxyl group on the other. The elements of this then add up to a water molecule. So essentially, we look at it as if the alkene has absorbed a molecule of water, or in other words, when you absorb water, you are hydrated. We're going to look at three different sets of conditions for doing this that each have their own particular characteristics and uses. The first one we're going to look at is what is called acid catalyzed hydration. The observed reaction looks something like this. We start with an alkene, we put in dilute strong acid. Now when we say dilute strong acid, what we are really talking about is diluted with water. So this, using sulfuric acid as the strong acid, would be essentially equivalent to sulfuric acid dissolved in water. That's important for two reasons. First of all, we're going to see that because the sulfuric acid is dissolved in water, the water can be a participant in the reaction. The other thing that we're going to see is that if we were to very carefully look at the structure of the acid, the acid itself is no longer sulfuric acid, but in fact hydronium, since sulfuric acid reacts almost completely with water to become hydrogen sulfate ion and hydronium. In this reaction then, again, the structural change is that the double bond becomes a single bond. We make a bond to hydrogen on one side and to hydroxyl on the other side. This creates, as a product, an alcohol. This reaction actually follows a mechanism which is the exact reverse of a mechanism that we already learned, the mechanism of dehydration. If we look in our first step, the alkene, which has a high electron density in its double bond, is attracted to and reacts with the hydrogen of the acid, which will have a large partial positive charge. Because the hydrogen can only have one pair of electrons attached to it, it will let go of the bond on the other side. In this case, I've chosen to represent the acid as HB hydrogen attached to conjugate base. The specific acid in this case is probably hydronium, but again, we will see that we can see that there are other acid base reactions and potentially one of these other intermediate acids could also do this. When we break the double bond and make a bond to the hydrogen, we leave only three bonds on the other carbon, which therefore creates a carbocation and rearrangements are very common in this reaction. So the carbocation would rearrange. In that case, the alpha carbon would change. When the carbocation has reached its final place, then a molecule of water will react with the carbocation, the water acting like a nucleophile. Now, where did the water come from? Well, the water came from this, dilute. When we say dilute, we mean take a reasonably small amount of sulfuric acid and mix it with a large amount of water. We actually don't write typically the water on the reactant arrow, although potentially we could. That water then, all of that water becomes available to act like a nucophile and even potentially as a base. A pair of electrons from the oxygen will come and make a bond to the carbocation and we will get this intermediate where if we notice, what we really have done is we've attached a water molecule to our carbon skeleton. When we do that, both hydrogens come with the oxygen, so we end up with one, two, three bonds to that central oxygen, which gives it a positive formal charge. Very much like we saw in the SN1 reaction, it's possible to essentially get rid of the formal charge by deprotonating or removing a hydrogen in an acid-base reaction. 
So a base will come over and make a bond to one of the hydrogens. The pair of electrons on the other side will go on to the oxygen. And that would give us our final product. So if we look at this then, it turns out that hydration and dehydration are in equilibrium to each other with each other. What we're actually doing here then is controlling the equilibrium using Le Chatelier's principle by adjusting the concentration of water. So in the reaction as written above, if we start with an alkene, a high concentration of water and an acid catalyst, that would favor shifting the reaction toward the right, toward the alcohol product. In contrast, in dehydration, what we do is we start with the alcohol and the acid and a low concentration of water, and the reaction shifts to the left to try to produce more water. This is a practical application of Le Chatelier's principle. Organic chemists use this kind of principle very often in controlling their reactions. It gives them a great deal of flexibility so that we can either produce an alcohol or convert an alcohol into an alkene as needed. The other two elements of this would be the regioselectivity. Because the hydrogen is acting as an electrophile, it's going to follow Markovnikov's rule. Hydrogen will attach to the less substituted carbon so that we produce the more stable carbocation intermediate. For stereochemistry, we have no selectivity. It turns out that ultimately both syn and anti-addition occurs, which means that there is the potential for up to four different stereoisomeric products from this reaction. Our next hydration reaction we're going to look at has sort of a mouthful of a name. It's called oxymercuration demercuration. This was discovered in the 1950s at a time when they had begun to name reactions according to the structural changes that we were observing rather than naming them after people or other kind of non-informational things. Our observed reaction looks like this. We take an alkene. We react it first with mercury 2 acetate in water. When that reaction is completely done then, we actually do a second step. We add something else. In this case, we add a reagent that has this formula, sodium boron hydrogen. This reagent is called sodium borohydride, and we're going to use it for other purposes in a later chapter. At the end of the reaction, what we see is, again, we've done a hydration. We've added elements of water in the form of a hydrogen on one carbon and a hydroxyl on the other. Our mechanism is much more complex. In the first step of the mechanism, the mercury-2 acetate actually partially dissociates to give mercury-2 monoacetate with a positive charge and then a molecule of acetate ion. The mercury-2 monoacetate then reacts with the alkene. Because the mercury has a positive charge, a pair of electrons from the pi bond moves out and makes a bond to the mercury. However, interestingly enough, because mercury is such a large atom, it can use a pair of its D electrons to make a bond back to the other carbocation-like carbon. This all occurs in one step. We reach out this way and then it grabs that way. What this does is it creates a ring containing the mercury. The mercury will still have a positive charge and it will also have the acetate ion still attached to it. So we generally draw it like this. This is called a cyclic mercurinium ion. Used to be called a cyclic mercuronium ion, onium being 
an ending that indicates positive charge. Because the mercury has a positive charge, the bonds between the mercury and the carbon are going to be very polar. The mercury will be pulling electrons away from the carbon, and the carbons will gain small partial positive charges. This will provide an opportunity for a nucleophile, water in this case, which is present in a very high concentration, to be attracted to the carbon and make a bond. Because carbon can't have five bonds, at the same time that this oxygen makes a bond to the carbon, the carbon will let go of a bond to the mercury. That will create an intermediate which looks like this. We now have the mercury attached to only one of the carbons. It now is neutral, doesn't have a positive charge because it gained an electron effectively. And we have on the other carbon essentially a water molecule. The oxygen has three bonds and it has a positive charge. So very similar to what we've seen earlier, a base could come over, remove a hydrogen from that oxygen, a pair of electrons would go onto the oxygen, and we would get this intermediate. And this is actually the product of the first part of the reaction. Now, I'd briefly like to just show you why we can make this ring. We can make the ring because if we look at the relative size, of mercury and hydrogen atoms, uh, mercury and carbon atoms, we can see that mercury is a much larger atom than carbon. I just sort of drew this. I don't even know what the relative sizes are, but they're quite large. So if you imagine then that we have this carbon-carbon bond, the carbons and the carbon would have a roughly spherical cloud of electron around them. The mercury is so much larger that it can interact with this sphere and interact with that sphere while it's sitting right over the middle. That's essentially what creates the three-membered ring. At the end of our first reaction, we have this species. This is a molecule that has a mercury directly bonded to organic carbon molecules. This turns out to be extremely dangerous. <laughs> It is both extremely toxic and poisonous, and if you dry it, taking away from water, it's also explosive. So we don't keep this for very long. Instead, what we do is we, in a second operation, we add sodium borohydride. I'm not gonna provide the mechanism for how this occurs, but sodium borohydride effectively replaces the mercury with, a with an atom of hydrogen. It's a free radical mechanism, which we will cover in a different chapter. You don't actually know, have to know specifically how it works. This is why we need to have two separate reagents in this reaction. And I should point out that you cannot write these all together at the same time. You must put the number one and the number two to be correctly writing these reagents. In an exam situation, you would lose points for not putting the numbers next to the specific reagents. One of the important things about this reaction is that if we look, we go straight from the alkene to the cyclic mercury without ever forming a carbocation. Therefore, there is no possibility of rearrangement in this reaction. It does, however, still follow Markovnikov's rule. As far as stereochemistry goes, both syn and anti-addition are observed. With regard to regioselectivity, we can explain the regioselectivity by looking at the electron density on the carbons in the cyclic intermediate. So if we imagine using this reactant, which has two carbon groups on one of the carbons of the alkene, but only one carbon on the other. In the first step, we would form our cyclic mercury intermediate. We would see that there would be a pos partial positive charge on this carbon, which used to be part of the alkene, and also on this carbon. 
If the mercury were to sit exactly in the middle, what we would expect is that the electron density in both of those bonds would be balanced, the electron density on the carbons would be balanced, the partial positives would be exactly the same size. However, it turns out that the mercury can sort of lean to one side, become closer to one of the carbons and farther away from the other carbon. In that case then, the bond between the mercury and the carbon that is farther away becomes weaker. There's less electrons donating to the carbon and the partial positive on that side would become larger. If this were to happen, we would expect the mercury to lean toward the less substituted carbon so that the positive charge is on the more substituted carbon, remembering that the more substituted a carbocation is, the more stable. So, by analogy, the more substituted a molecule or an atom with a partial positive is, the more stable it is, the lower the potential energy. Because it's then leaning, and the partial positive is so much larger on the more substituted carbon, when the nucleophile approaches, it's going to be more strongly attracted to the carbon with the larger partial positive. So the nucleophile will add to the more substituted carbon and the mercury will end up on the less substituted carbon. As I note here, there's another reason why mercury might lean. Mercury, as I pointed out, is a very large atom. So it's, when there are large substituents on a carbon, it's going to become very crowded. So it would be beneficial in terms of its potential energy to lean away toward a less substituted atom because of steerics. Once that water molecule has attached on the more substituted side and then becomes deprotonated, we get this intermediate. And what we see is in the second step where we replace the mercury with the hydrogen. The hydrogen will specifically go on whichever atom the mercury is attached. In this case, the mercury will become attached to the less substituted carbon, so the hydrogen will go on the less substituted carbon. This is Markovnikov's rule. So this molecule follows Markovnikov regioselectivity.